Minnesotans gather at the state fair and lawmakers state their ideas as we move closer to election day. We catch up with several state senators in this week's Capitol Report. Hello everybody and thank you for tuning in to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The Minnesota State Fair draws hundreds of thousands each year in search of the latest fair food, freebies, and a chance to get educated on key issues facing Minnesotans. With the November election closing in, we caught up with Senator Scott Newman at the Senate booth. He discusses his thoughts on the special session, the voter ID constitutional amendment, and the focus of the 2013 legislative session. Senator Scott Newman, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, happy to be here. Senator, first of all, I'd like your impression of special session. It just obviously recently ended. Um, my impression would be is, is uh, I, would, I am disappointed in the process uh, in that we spent, you know, under just under $200 million and a bill was passed that didn't go through the legislative process and I find that somewhat troubling. I would much prefer uh, to have it go, even though we're in a special session and I have no trouble with the one bill being entertained, but send it through the regular legislative process so that it can be properly vetted. And uh, uh, I, I see no reason why we couldn't have done that, uh, given the fact that the storm uh, that I thought we were dealing with was frankly in June, and it turned out we were dealing with storms in June and July uh, in terms of wind damage. So uh, I was disappointed in the process, uh, but I do understand that the folks in particular up in Duluth, uh, we, do, we do have an obligation to help those folks in terms of infrastructure. Senator, let's move on to this election season. We're fully entrenched in campaign season right now, and you have um, a couple of vested interests here. One is in voter ID, the bill you were the Senate author of, right. and the second one would be obviously your re-election. So first of all, what are you hearing from constituents as you're knocking on doors to both issues? You know, on how people thought you did as a lawmaker, how they thought the legislature did in general, and on the voter ID bill. Well, in terms of, of specifically my race and uh, the uh, election in general. Uh, I feel very good about it, very positive. Uh, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback. And for those who uh, don't happen to agree with me on my stance on issues, uh, are uh, thankful uh, and, and uh, have thanked me for at least giving them an idea as to why I vote on issues the way I do. And I, on a weekly basis, I try and send an email burst out, say, these are the bills that came up during the past week. This is how I voted. These are the reasons why. And I feel uh, I get a lot of response from people that, you know, Newman, I don't agree with you, but I, I appreciate the fact that you are talking to us and giving us your reasons. In terms of the, the uh, election in general, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, I will say that I think that the 2012 election, both nationwide and state, uh, is uh, perhaps one of the three most important elections in the history of the United States. I felt that for a long time. I think it's going to determine the direction of our country for the next hundred years. And that's why it's really, really important. Because we really are at a crossroads as to whether or not uh, we're going to go the direction that President Obama wants to take us, or we're going to go the direction that presumably uh, uh, Mr. Romney wants to take us. So I just, I would leave this with the voters. Uh, it's really an important election. I would encourage everyone to get out and vote. If one were to gauge the polls on the voter ID issue, one would anticipate that that particular bill, that piece of legislation, that constitutional amendment, I should say, will pass. Are you feeling confident? Are you hearing such from folks that you're talking to as well? Well, keep in mind that I live in a rural area and I represent uh, you know, rural folks, and I think that the support for the voter ID is much greater in rural Minnesota than, say, uh, in the urban areas. So the, the feedback that I'm getting on voter ID is very, very positive, very positive. Uh, and I, I believe that my constituents will vote to approve that amendment overwhelmingly. Now, having said that, don't forget, we're still waiting on the Supreme Court on both the suit to... Uh, take the, the initiative off the ballot this fall and also the retitling issue. So we don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do yet. Finally, Senator, working under the assumption you are reelected, and well, and even if you are not, 
What kind of advice would you give for lawmakers as they come in in January as far as trying to get work done that perhaps was left unfinished? Well, obviously, you know, coming in in January, it's, the budget is going to be the big one. And uh, I would anticipate uh, that Governor Dayton will request uh, a significant increase. If you remember last go around, he wanted $40 billion. Uh, and I think he's going to ask for more than that now. And so the budget is going to be front and center. Uh, and the other thing that I personally believe is very important is regulatory reform. I believe that we as a state uh, are overregulated by our agencies and we should be taking a look at that in order to uh, help private businesses succeed in the state of Minnesota. And as far as um, some of the lawmakers we've spoken to in the past have said, incoming members need to maybe take a step back and learn the process. Would you agree with that or do you think they can come in and, and, and accomplish business right away? Well, <laughs> uh, everybody has an election certificate that they've worked very hard for, so everyone is entitled to uh, entertain any kind of legislation that they want. However, there I will say this about uh, coming into the legislature, there is a steep learning curve, both procedurally and substantively. So uh, I, I think that they should at least sit back and try and learn before they uh, go charging around and, and, and trying to change the world all in one fell swoop. Senator Scott Newman, thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Just hours after the interview with Senator Scott Newman, the state Supreme Court ruled on the Secretary of State's changing of the titles of the two ballot initiatives. That ruling was in favor of those challenging the Secretary of State. The best place to make sure there's an accurate ballot title is by it being forged by the consensus in the legislature. With the marriage amendment, this was a bipartisan effort, not the vote on it, but the uh, agreement as to what the title was, that it was uh, proposed by Senator uh, Dibble of Minneapolis and accepted by Senator Limmer as a, as a friendly amendment. And that is a much better way to form ballot titles than to have the Secretary of State unilaterally intervening and imposing what he thinks is a better title on this. The constitutional balance uh, it shows that there should be deference to the legislature. That's what the state Supreme Court said, and I think they got the constitutional balance right. The reason why I say this is a big day for the people of Minnesota is that the Supreme Court correctly recognized the constitutional authority of the legislature. The legislature is the representational branch that represents the voice of the people, not the Secretary of State, not the executive branch. And this particular decision recognizes that close relationship between the legislature and the people of Minnesota. These bills and their titles were fully vetted through the legislative process and approved by the Minnesota legislature. And they are now before the people of Minnesota. And the Supreme Court ruled, I think correctly, uh, that they do, in fact, accurately describe what decision is being placed before voters. Senator Terry Bonoff made the rounds at the State Fair discussing her ideas for protecting K-12 education as the state faces yet another budget deficit. We caught up with her to discuss these ideas and other issues as well. So, Senator, my first question for you relates to obviously the latest thing, the special session. Just give me your impression of the work that was done. I thought it went really well. I thought it was a time where the leaders decided ahead of time what we were going to tackle and they kept their promise and you know that may sound like a simple thing but it's really not because when the leaders give their promise they're giving their promise for many many people and it's not very easy to manage that process and so I think we came together and we did what was right for Minnesota. You mentioned process. Senator Newman earlier said he was critical of the process. He thought it should have been vetted more thoroughly through um, through committee. So what's your reaction to those words? You know I don't I didn't agree with that and I know there were some members of um, 
the Senate who agreed with him, some of in his caucus, and they were uh, very outspoken about that. But you know, it was interesting. They could have actually used a procedural motion to send that back to committee. And so while they complained, they didn't in fact do that. So I'm not sure how serious their complaint really was. You know, I think what is important is to focus on the people of that area. Focus on the people who were victims of the flooding and not worry about vetting, you know, dotting this I and crossing this T. Let's get them help, for gosh sakes. Let's come together and get them the help they needed. Moving into this campaign season, well, we're fully into the campaign season. Senator, I want just tell me a little bit about what you're hearing from people as far as the work that was done with the legislature and things that you think need, remain to be done. When I knock on people's doors, one of the things I hear most often is that they really want their legislative representatives to work together. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, they want us to find a way to work together to compromise for the good of all. That's one thing. The other thing is I find people are still very, very concerned about the economy. People are concerned about um, being out of work, concerned there, there could still be more layoffs. You know, while I see hopeful signs emerging that we are getting stronger, I understand there's still a great deal of worry and, and fear about long-term financial stability. You know, when the markets took the hit that they did, you know, that took a toll on many people's retirement. And as the baby boomers are aging, there's a lot of people out there that have um, reason to be concerned. Senator, assuming all factors remain equal in January when the legislature reconvenes, it's a budget year, there's a projected budget deficit. What do you anticipate your role being as an assistant minority leader to try to come to a consensus, work with the governor, work with the Republicans? Do you see that being possible? Well, Julie, I have to reject the premise. I don't think all things you know, will remain equal. I actually don't. I think if you look at what happened in this two-year cycle, you know, the Republicans had not been in control of the Senate since the mid-70s. And as they took control, things didn't go particularly very well. You know, they chose Amy Koch for their leader, and I think she was a strong leader. And then they had their, uh, their situation with regard to Amy's leadership, and I think they handled it very poorly. And so, you know, when the four men uh, kind of took that problem to the streets with their megaphone and then there seemed to be quite a bit of discontent among the caucus members after that and I think it was exceedingly hard to get things done and the most moderate Republicans left in the Senate many of them retired this past session I think when it comes to leadership that we would be more stable as a state and be able to be stronger and have action just coming out of the gate if in fact the um, Democrats were in the majority in the Senate. Okay, Senator, so let's move away from that premise then. And you being a very strong proponent, of course, of K-12 education, given the projected budget deficit, do you think K-12 can remain held harmless? I don't think we're gonna cut K-12 spending. What we owe the people of Minnesota is to make sure we're spending every dollar wisely. And I don't think that we have done enough to make sure that we are um, using a shared services approach when it comes to uh, administrative costs. I think we should still be tackling where are there ways that we can uh, work together to have, say, regional um, shared services in back office functions and things like that. I think that we can lower the cost of delivering education to make sure that every dollar goes to the classroom. And then that we deliver on our promise to our kids. We have to make certain that every single child, regardless of where they live, what their income is, or what their dreams are, that they have an education that allows them to fulfill their potential. Do you think this is possible as well? Yes, I do. I am a demand for it, not just possible. Okay, Senator Terry Bonoff with those words, thank you for your time. Thank you. The Minnesota Senate booth has a tradition of drawing big crowds, but this year the Senate broke from tradition and chose to use its space to educate people on the new district maps. Public Information Officer Scott Magnuson describes the changes even further and the reaction from fairgoers. Well, the big difference, obviously, no opinion poll survey. The House does have an opinion poll survey. Uh, we're doing the same as we did back in 2002, the last time uh, redistricting took place. We have a large redistricting display. 
we have the legislative district maps and then also the computers here, laptops. People can type in their address and zip code. And we'll give them their new district, also who the candidates are. Um, this year, I don't recall a year where the numbers have changed so drastically. For example, uh, if you live in Shakopee, Jordan, uh, Prior Lake, your district used to be 35, now it's 55. If you live in West St. Paul, South St. Paul, your district used to be 39, now it's uh, 52. And so uh, we, we felt that was the best use of our uh, time, our resources, and we'll certainly go back to our opinion poll survey next year. What are you hearing from people as far as coming in and using you know, technology, obviously, to find their districts? Have you found that this has helped exponentially, or did most people already know what their districts were? Oh, no. I would say well less than half are not aware of the specifics. They may know who some of the candidates are. They don't know the new number. Um, so I, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's certainly well less than half. So uh, we, th we think it's served a good purpose. A total of 16 state senators are not seeking re-election for a variety of reasons. Included in that number are longtime state senator Jen Olson and one-term state senator Mary Jo McGuire. As each prepares for life away from the state capitol, each gave their advice and insight to incoming legislators. The legislative process and the dynamics and the environment is uh, something that you kind of have to experience in order to learn it. You can't come in prepared. And so to assume that, that uh, you know everything when you start is probably not a good stance to take. And uh, one of the things since uh, Minnesota has been known for uh, supporting kind of divided government, I think it, it adds even additional challenges to uh, developing relationships, treating one another with respect, regardless of whether you agree on is all issues or not, because that is essential in order to keep good communications and working toward solutions that are in the best interest of the people of the state of Minnesota. And given that, do you think that that's possible or probable next session that people can work together and not make assumptions? Well the proof will be in the pudding. I hope that that is the case that they will learn that you can't just come in and demand that things be the way you want them to be. Um, that, that in terms of the issues you work on and that they also may add that there's more to the job than just the opinions on hot button issues as well. Um, People have challenges dealing with the state government that's been created by legislators over the years, and uh, and help help through that, the, helping them through that process is an excellent way for to us to learn what we have done, and and pro perhaps see areas where there's needed need for change. So it's not only a help to our citizens, but also can guide us to a better future. People have been getting elected out of certain factions, you know, of, of different parties, and I f think they feel that they need to stay really true to that faction that might have elected them. And I, th I want to say to them now that you know that they're elected, they really need to be open-minded about what's before them at the legislature, to not promise too many things. And we get people that are signing pledges. My advice would be don't sign pledges, because you don't know what you're going to be faced with in the upcoming session. We really need to watch out for the good of the state and, you know, to really, um, as I said, be open-minded. Minnesota's outdoors are a destination point for many, and the clean water and abundant natural resources are a source of pride for most residents. Keeping those resources healthy and plentiful requires dedication and determination. John Brune looks at the most significant ways Minnesota provides funding for its environment and natural resources. Natural resources play a major role in Minnesota's identity as a state. 
Lakes, rivers, and streams are an abundant source of activity for thousands of people each year. Forests, prairies, and parks also provide lasting recreation and enjoyment. These and other resources can also be natural habitats for many species, all of which must be protected. Minnesota must balance habitat and recreation to preserve this environment for future generations. To do this, the state provides two primary funding sources, user fees, and two constitutional amendments, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and the Legacy Amendment. Each time you purchase a hunting or fishing license, for example, the money is used to help fund specific areas related to natural resources. Other fees collected help to fund other specified areas. We have a number of user fees um, that, that will fund uh, most of, at least our major environment natural resources agencies. Some of the minor ones have a lot more general fund, but the major ones are all funded primarily through user fees, game and fish license fees, um, snowmobile registration, watercraft licensing, the DNR, and the Pollution Control Agency, you've got the, the fees for permits. Um, we do have a fee on the motor vehicle transfers that where the money goes in there. That's a, a little bit more of a general one. Um, then also there's a tax on garbage um, that goes to the, the Pollution Control Agency. So those are, those are primarily our, our major fee-driven agencies, our Department of Natural Resources and Pollution Control Agency. The money generated by these fees is collected by the state and deposited into specific accounts. Every two years, the legislature appropriates the money from those accounts. It acts just like a, it's appropriated similar to a general fund appropriation, only we specify which account it's coming out of. Like the Game and Fish Fund, all the, all the fees for Game and Fish licenses are put into the one fund, um, and that fund um, is then appropriated for those activities, for the, for the basic activities that the department does to regulate and to uh, um, you know, administer the game, game and Fish laws in the state. Voters approved an amendment to the state constitution in 1988 to help protect and enhance Minnesota's outdoors. The Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund is designed to supply long-term, consistent financial support for various aspects of the state's abundant natural resources. Well, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund was set up to kind of broaden our environment and natural resources including increasing habitat, but it also has much broader uh, implica implications. It, it's to, we, the, the state has funded a number of uh, environment ed education programs out of that, a number of studies that, that lead to improvements of the environment natural resources in the state. It can be used for basically all environment and natural resources projects. It, it includes research, um, uh, environmental education, things like that. The Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund consists of state lottery proceeds and investment earnings. By law, the fund's balance cannot be spent. Only a percentage of the balance may be used each year on environment-related projects. It's the job of the Legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources, the LCCMR, to decide where that percentage of lottery proceeds should be spent. What happens is 40% of the net proceeds, after all payments are made, after all prizes are awarded, and all costs are, 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 are subtracted. 40% of the net proceeds get, to, get deposited in, into the trust fund. Um, that's been building since 1989, um, and it's, a, it's about 600 million today. Um, and then th what happens is, uh, under the Constitution, 5.5% per year um, can be spent um, by the, le can be appropriated by law by the legislature. Uh, so currently, uh, the LCCMR, or Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, is, is, has the duty to make a recommendation to the legislature on how to spend that money. That will be a list of what they've determined to be uh, the highest priority projects to, to fund, and the legislature can do as they will with it. Sometimes they've made changes, sometimes they haven't. Um, but they will take those recommendations and then appropriate money uh, from the trust fund um, as, as allowed under the Constitution. Um, and then appropriate for specific projects. And there are a number of, you know, sometimes they've had hundreds of projects that have come forward. Once the LCCMR concludes its work, the legislature decides on the recommendations and begins work on legislation to appropriate funds to the proper agencies. In 2008, the legislature passed another constitutional amendment to, to pass on to the voters to vote on that. That's the uh, legacy amendment. What, what that does is, uh, taxes, uh, pr provides an additional sales tax of three-eighths of one percent uh, on, on the general sales tax, 
and that money then is divided up. 33% um, of that goes for uh, the Outdoor Heritage Fund for habitat projects. 33% um, goes to the Clean Water Fund for clean water projects. Um, 19 and, and three quarters percent goes into the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund for Arts and Cultural Heritage projects, which are not necessarily outdoor projects, but they are, it is part of the legacy uh, amendment. And then 14 and a quarter percent um, goes toward the uh, Park and Trail Fund, and that's used for um, part, basically to support uh, parks and trails of a, of a statewide or regional significance in the state. So that's important because a couple of factors, you know, uh, the first part with the Outdoor Heritage Fund, that's to try to get our habitat back to some level, a higher level that it's been. It, it, it's not to do the day-to-day -day DNR projects that are paid for the Game and Fish Fund or other funds, but to, to try to restore and increase um, habitat for, for wildlife in the state. Um, where the, uh, and the Clean Water Fund, um, that's to try to restore some of our, our lakes, rivers, and, and waters, uh, and, and water, other waterways in the state. It's mostly to, um, to comply with uh, federal requirements under the Clean Water Act. Uh, we have an, a lot of lakes, rivers, and streams in the state, and uh, many of those are impaired. And under the Clean Waters Act, we have to recognize where those impairments are and have a plan to correct the impairment. Um, and that's, uh, so that's a major, that's a major uh, ordeal to, to, to comply with the Clean Water Act. And so that's, that money is to help the state um, go down that road. Uh, the Arts and Cultural Heritage, as the name implies, it's, it's basically a, a, to improve arts and cultural heritage in the state. Um, and then the Parks and Trails money, that's for um, support of, uh, of our parks and trails in the state. The ones, those of statewide and regional significance is the way the Constitution reads. Okay. I, I think the key here is that we fund most of environment natural resources through fees, the, the fee base, and that pays for the basic on the ground services. It doesn't, it doesn't pay f necessarily for a lot of improvement to those, uh, to those acti activities. Whereas with the, the two um, constitutional funds, uh, the two constitutional amendments, they help to pay for some of the, uh, to, to some of the improvements that need to be made and, and, and getting beyond kind of the day-to-day -day activities. Enjoying the outdoors is a time-honored tradition in Minnesota. Consistent efforts to maintain and protect the state's environment and its natural inhabitants are critical to all future generations. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the State Capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. And that wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.